All right, we're going to be uh, talking about the revelation of one God tonight. Stumbling to error or climbing to truth. Mm -hmm. So I want to get into some fun stuff with this tonight. And how, and I'll just remind you last week, and I've stressed during these series that, that we, the, um, the, the, the notion of one God is a command in the Old Testament, but it's a revelation in the New Testament. Mm -hmm. Okay, so it's commanded in the Old Testament in Deuteronomy 6, 4, Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God is one. But in the New Testament, it is done by revelation. Amen. So uh, let me move to the first slide here. Okay, Paul said that what he received, he got by revelation of God. In Galatians 1, 11 to 12, he says, For I would have you know, brothers, that the gospel that was preached by me is not man's gospel. For I did not receive it from any man, nor was I taught it, but I received it through revelation of Jesus Christ. Mm -hmm. The gospel is received through the revelation of Jesus Christ, as far as Paul. Now, that, he talks about the gospel. I'm, I know I'm talking about the oneness of God. Mm -hmm. But... Everything that came to Paul, he said, came by revelation. And we're going to see later how revelation, the actual book of revelation, backs that up. And revelation really means a revealing. Okay, so God reveals himself to us. He revealed the gospel to Jesus Christ. He reveals the gospel to you and to me. Praise God. So Amen. we are um, fairly assured that, that what Paul had taught and what he preached was something that was revealed to him. Okay, so um, I want to talk about the stumbling block. And this is a really important point. And this will make a lot of Christians really uncomfortable. But there is a stumbling block in the Word of God. A stumbling block exists in the Word of God that keeps people away from truth. Mm -hmm. And you ask yourself, well, we'll talk about this a little bit later, but, but uh, this notion that there is something that people trip over, okay? Mm -hmm. So in 1 Peter uh, 2, 7 to 8, he says, so the honor is for you who believe, but for those who do not believe, the stone that the builders rejected has become the cornerstone and a stone of stumbling and a rock of offense. They stumble because they disobeyed the word as they were destined to do. Mm -hmm. This is very harsh. A lot of people don't want to deal with this. And, you know, modern Christianity, we've kind of painted Jesus as this really kind of like kind dude that comes around and says, okay, hey, kumbaya, everybody, let's join hands. You're all welcome. You can do what you want. You know, I'm here to save you and make your life better. And in point of fact, there is a, uh, there is a built in stumbling block in the word of God that, that will, people will trip over and they trip over it because they disobey the word as they were destined to do. Mm -hmm. So it's the disobedience to the word that will cause them to stumble. What the Bible says. Mm -hmm. Okay, now I'm going to deal with just Matthew 28, 18 to 20 here. Excuse me. As that stumbling block. But the stumbling block is also um, very much goes to the born again experience you know being born of water and of the spirit uh is is something that uh, you know we know the word of god says being born of water uh, we see uh, it's baptism in the name of jesus being born of the spirit being filled with the spirit of god evidence by speaking in tongues and uh in point of fact so many people disobey that gospel okay they disobey the uh, the uh, salvation plan and they have watered down what it means to be Christian, simply just believing without any action put to it. Mm -hmm. Now, Jesus said in Matthew 28, 28, 18 to 20, he says, And Jesus came and said to them, All authority is in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Mm -hmm. and right there is your first clue. Mm -hmm. If all authority in heaven belongs to Jesus, where's God? God says he's never going to give his glory to another. That's right. right. That's right. But then he's given all his authority to Jesus. Right. What, what's happened here? You know, do we have the big father God with the white beard handing it off to his kid? You take over from here. 
Uh, it can't be that way. You know, the Bible, so many times, there's a notion that the that the one true God is the only creator, the only one there, will never give his glory to another. So we're faced with a little bit of a difficulty here. Either Jesus is God manifest in flesh, the one true God manifest in flesh, or the Bible is a ball of confusion. Mm -hmm. I refuse to believe the latter. Okay, so all authority in heaven is given to Jesus, then Jesus must be God manifest in flesh, the one true God manifest in flesh, if in fact, it stands that the Lord is not going to give his glory to another. All right? So he can't, he's not even giving it to another. His glory is embedded in Jesus. The glory of God is embedded in Jesus. He didn't give it to another because Jesus is, as we talked about last week, he is Yahweh, Yahshua, Yahshua, our Lord become our Savior. Right? So then he gives a command. He, he says, Go therefore and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all that I have commanded you, and behold, I am with you always to the end of the age. Uh, so, this is the sticking point. This is the only scripture in the Word of God that says to baptize in Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. But what we must remember is that Jesus said, baptize them in the name of the Father, of the Son, of the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all that I have commanded you. So we are really looking for the name, right? So the stumbling block is this scripture, Matthew 28, 18 to 19. And it's a stumbling block because mostly because of the accident of red letter editions. You know, people say, well, this is the red letter. Jesus said this. So we're going to do what Jesus said, and we're going to ignore what the apostles said. Forgetting, of course, that it was apostles who wrote Matthew. Mm -hmm. Forgetting, of course, that the apostles baptized in a completely different formula. No, excuse me, let me correct myself. Not a different formula. They baptized in the correct formula as mm -hmm. given by Jesus mm -hmm. when this particular scripture is viewed in the light of revelation of who God is. Mm -hmm. Okay, so the cornerstone is the first stone. Now I just want to talk about cornerstone a little bit too because, you know, Peter mentioned the cornerstone is the, the building, the, the stone that the builders rejected, that that's become the cornerstone. And the builders, obviously speaking of the Hebrew nation, the Jews, that they rejected this, this stone, but God has made this stone the cornerstone, right? Now what's important about the cornerstone is that it is not the stone that you see in buildings with the date on it, you know, and someday if that building's ever destroyed, they'll pull that stone out and inside it there's usually some items that were popular during the day so people can get a glimpse of what was going on during that time in history when the building was built. Uh, that's not it. The cornerstone is the very first stone laid in the foundation. It is the stone that determines how everything goes. So, you know, in your home, when it was built, if you live in a home, you live in an apartment, that apartment normally is parallel to the street or has some logic to how it was placed relative to the landscape. Well, that was done through surveying uh, and, you know, laying the, uh, what they call the, uh, I forget what it's called, but then they, the, the mason will put the cornerstone down. And he'll, put, he'll lay the cornerstone according to the plot of the land. And then he takes that blue string and, you know, it's, it's string with blue, stuff in it, you snap it, it'll chalk. make a line, chalk, yeah. And it lays that string both uh, parallel and perpendicular with that stone as its guide. Mm -hmm. And then every stone will be laid in place according to the way the cornerstone is faced. And that's, if you don't have that, you know, human beings have a tendency to, to wander a little bit you know, <laughs> and go, you need some kind of focus to make the building correct to make it to make it face the right direction otherwise that wall would become a little curved and windy after a while you know indeed uh, 
they teach you if you're plowing, you always look ahead, don't look behind, you know, make sure you have something to focus on so you plow straight because if you look behind you end up going all wiggly. But the question I think is, now the cornerstone is the rock of stumbling, but why would God put something in the Bible that had the potential of keeping folks out of the kingdom? You know, these things can trouble us when we think, of, why would God do that? We thought, you know, God wanted all to be saved. You know, isn't that the thing that God wanted to do? Why would God put something in there like that? Mm -hmm. And I think I have an answer to that question. All right. If we look at Matthew 22, 14, Matthew 20, 14 says, For many are called, but few are chosen. Matthew 7, 13 to 14. Enter by the narrow gate, for the gate is wide, and the way is easy that leads to destruction, and those who enter by it are many. For the gate is narrow, and the way is hard that leads to life, and those who find it are few. Mm -hmm. So this gives us an answer, mm -hmm. that even though many are called to live for God, only a few find the narrow way. Mm -hmm. Amen. Isn't that interesting? Only a mm -hmm. few find that narrow way. And, you know, when sheep are led into a pen, they're normally led into, it's almost like they funnel into the pen and there's a very narrow gate so that they go in one at a time. And why one at a time? Because the shepherd can count them mm -hmm. and know that he had the same number of sheep coming in the pen that he took out to graze. Right? So... The sheep has to find that narrow way, and the sheep gets to that narrow way by following the voice of the shepherd. As Jesus said, you know, as, as Peter said, excuse me, that those who stumble are those that do not obey the word of God. Mm -hmm. They don't obey the voice of Jesus. As a consequence, the other sheep, they go down the broad way, which leads to destruction. Mm -hmm. Right? Because they're not following the voice of the shepherd. So it's extremely important for the Christian to hear the voice of the shepherd. It is why it frustrates me to a great extent because I've talked to many people about the importance of being baptized in the name of Jesus. And some of them come up with an argument against it. And the argument normally comes from a tradition, a Christian tradition, but not from the Bible, right? And I, and I know you've heard before, well, my pastor told me, or so-and-so televangelist told me, or so-and-so said this, and they're not listening to the voice of the Word of God. What does the Word of God tell you? Does the Word of God tell you over and over that you should baptize in Father, Son, and Holy Spirit? Because the only scripture that exists of that formula is Matthew 28, 19. Or do you hear the voice of the word of God where you see people being baptized in the name of Jesus in the book of Acts and mentioned, of course, also in the Gospels? Paul talked about it. Romans chapter 6. So this whole notion of, of following Jesus is following what he says, following what is in the word. Now, mind you, many people will say, well, I'm following what Jesus said because I'm following Matthew 28, 19. Okay, so you're following, you're following what Jesus says, but Jesus gave the apostles mm -hmm. the job mm -hmm. of proclaiming the gospel. Mm -hmm. And they are the ones who wrote the Bible, sure. right? He made them witnesses. Mm -hmm. Jesus told them and they were to tell the world. So we have to listen to what the apostles said. Now the apostles, did they disobey Matthew 28, 19, or did they obey it? Well, if the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Ghost is Jesus, as we talked about before, they obeyed it. They obeyed it. We talked about that last week, the name of Jesus, how important it was, how the name of Jesus encapsulated everything. It was the, it was the name, it is the name above every name. It is the name that is given to us to be saved. It is the name that delivers, that sets free. It's the name that casts out demons, that causes people to be whole. So 
people stumble on the name, on the scripture. And this scripture, Matthew 28, 19, really is a rock of stumbling and a stone of offense because if you get the revelation that the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Ghost is Jesus, number one, nobody's ever going to take that revelation away from you because it's given by God. Mm -hmm. And number two, it opens up their eyes. You see two things when that happens. You see, number one, that you need to be baptized in the name of Jesus for the remission of your sins. And number two, you see that, uh, that God is one. Mm -hmm. That God himself was in Christ reconciling the world to himself. That it was not a second person of a trinity. It was number one God. Mm -hmm. Hallelujah. Amen. That the old guy with the beard is the, old, is the young guy with the beard. Mm -hmm. <laughs> They're one and the same. Come on now. All right. And what a wonderful thing that is. That God himself, instead of commissioning. You know, as I told you last week, I was at a problem. You know, with God the Father sitting up there, you know, with the, with the big Neptune-like beard all the way down to his knees. You know, and I'm way too holy. I am way too holy. I'm far too wonderful to go down and save these people. Son, you do it. You go down there and die for them. And I will receive them once you've done your job. I always had a problem with that. What's the matter if God didn't want to do it himself? Mm -hmm. You know, I, I always had a problem with that. But mm -hmm. when we understand that God did do it himself, mm -hmm. that God is Jesus, hallelujah, that blows my mind. Mm -hmm. It's like God really did walk among us. God really did go to extraordinary lengths. And God knew that God would have to do this even before God said, let there be light. Mm -hmm. Isn't that a massive, magnificent mm -hmm. thing? Mm -hmm. You know, so this thing is so precious and important and revelatory that unless you are willing to hear what thus saith the Lord, you will not get it. So if you listen to the wrong voices, you're not going to get the truth. And Matthew 28, 19 is going to be a stone of stumbling. You're going to trip over it. Mm -hmm. You'll be stuck there. You won't get baptized in the name of Jesus for the remission of your sins. You won't see that God is one. Mm -hmm. You won't really know who God is. Mm -hmm. You'll see God as Trinity, but that's not God. Mm -hmm. When you have the revelation of one God, you know who God is. Mm -hmm. You absolutely know beyond the shadow of doubt who God is. No one has to tell it to you. No one has to say it's a mystery. It's no mystery to you. Know God. Hallelujah. And of course, the key is that entering the kingdom of God depends upon knowing God in a personal way. Mm -hmm. You have to know God in a personal way. In a very personal way. Because when you really know somebody, how do you know someone? In a very personal way. You know, we make a dis distinction between, well, I met that person once, or that person's an acquaintance of mine. But when that, that person's very close, you know a lot about it. Right? And when we know God, it's going to be that kind of personal and deep relationship that we will have. Not some... Not some, well, I know God, but he's kind of a mystery to me because I don't understand this three-in-one thing. Mm -hmm. You know? No. That, that, that you can't know God that way. It'd be, it'd be like mm -hmm. my, if Brother Casey's been my friend for a long time. said, well, you know, I, I know, kind of know Casey, you know, I know him, but he's this three-in-one creature. I, I, there's a mystery about him. I, there's no mystery. Right? There's no mystery when we know God. Mm -hmm. That's right. Hallelujah. Hebrews... Um, 8, 10 to 11 says, for this is the covenant. And this is a quote, by the way, <clears throat> from uh, Jeremiah 31. For this is the covenant that I will make with the house of Israel after those days, declares the Lord. I will put my laws into their minds and write them on their hearts and I will be their God. And they shall be my people and they shall teach, they shall not teach each one his neighbor and each one his brother saying, know the Lord, for they shall all know me from the least of them to the greatest. Amen. So we won't be teaching no God, no God. They will know God personally. Mm -hmm. Hallelujah. Now remember, the oneness of God is a command in the Old Testament. But in the New Testament, the oneness of God comes via the revelation of the name of Jesus. So the revelation is an uncovering. Mm -hmm. God uncovers himself. And that's an important thing to know because the uncovering is a powerful picture 
of how God reveals himself to us, and it has an earthly counterpart I'll go into later. So, knowing God means to have his name and his very person etched in our hearts. And they'll know me. They will know me. They will be intimately acquainted with me. They won't have to figure out who I am. They'll be intimately acquainted with who I am. Woo, that's powerful. Mm -hmm. Because Ezekiel 11, 19 to 20 says this, And I will give them one heart, and a new spirit I will put within them. I will remove the heart of stone from their flesh, and give them a heart of flesh, that they may walk in my statutes, and keep my rules and obey them, and they shall be my people, and I will be their God. Mm -hmm. Amen. An internal transformation that God wants to do in the heart of the Christian. Mm -hmm. To really absolutely etch his name and the very essence of his person into our psyche. That we know precisely who God is. We have no question whatsoever. No question whatsoever. We know God personally. You know, and, I, and I think, I don't want to diminish that, you know, this whole, you know, I have to have a personal relationship with Jesus Christ. We heard that. That was a very popular phrase in the 80s. But it's deeper even than that. It's a very deep communal relationship, very close, very intimate relationship that God wants to have with us. Hallelujah. Thank God mm -hmm. he wants to have that. Yeah. So only those who cleave to the Lord with all their heart, mind, soul, and strength are granted the access to knowing God in his oneness and fullness. As a wife must cleave to her husband and open herself to him completely, we must cleave to our Lord and open ourselves completely to him in the spirit. It's that kind of, I'll just have to use the word, it's a spiritual nakedness. Mm -hmm. Complete openness. God wants to reveal himself to us and we reveal ourselves to God. It's that kind of very close and deep re internal relationship that is completely spiritual and completely open and completely revelatory. It's the revelation of the name, mm -hmm. you see. Now the reason that the name is so important is that because the name carries with it a revelation of the character. So your name, when someone knows your name and intimate, well, let's just put it uh, this way, that some people might know me as Mr. Nevius. Past Nevis, but once another me very intimately would call me Jim. You know, there's a personal knowledge and a personal connection there, right? That that is 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 very strong. And of course, my wife knows me even more intimately than anybody else. Right? She knows everything about me. She knows she knows me warts and all, right? Because she spends time with me. We sleep in the same bed, we wake up together every morning. You know, we are with each other a good amount of our lives and because of that we have an intimate relationship and that's the kind of intimate relationship God wants with us mm -hmm. and he wants to reveal himself to us but we need to listen to what he says you know now here the dynamic that God has set up that is echoed in the family the bride the bridegroom the head of the bride right it really still works in the dynamic of the church in that He's calling the shots. We need to listen to the word that God tells us and obey the word and look into the word and seek the word, hallelujah, mm -hmm. as it is delivered by the apostles so that we, in fact, may have that into a relationship. If we stumble at the word, we can't get it. If we stumble at Matthew 28, 19 and say, oh, but Jesus said this, and I, I know the apostles baptized in Jesus' name, but, but Jesus did this and, and Jesus did it. No, that can't be right. Well, it's in the Bible, man. That's all I used to tell people. It's in the Bible. Mm -hmm. I got more scriptures to tell you you should be baptized mm -hmm. in Jesus' name than you got me telling me I should baptize the Father. Mm -hmm. That I promise you. Amen. Right. And so as a consequence, knowing and having that revelation of that name completely uncovers God to us. If we, if we obey that scripture and we, bat, and we are baptized in Jesus' name, we get the revelation that Jesus is the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Ghost. I mean, come on. It's just an open, God's an open book to us at that point. Mm -hmm. 
God has revealed himself. Hallelujah. This is, and you know, you ask yourself, because the question goes back to why would God do this? Because, you know, you don't just want to have an intimate relationship with anybody. Not even God. You want a relationship with someone who really wants to know you. You know, if you have a relationship with somebody and it's uh, kind of a casual thing, you know, there's never really going to be that intimacy and that love of staring into each other's eyes, you know, becoming enraptured. Of, oh, you know, I love you. You know, because you're never going to have that. You're never going to have that trust and that openness that you really need, that, you know, that, that nakedness of soul that a couple really needs to have to really make it, you know. And, and, and that's such an important component. Of, of a marriage, whether it happens at the time you meet or it happens after a few years, you're going to need to get there eventually. You know, God, that, and you don't want to have an intimate relationship with just anybody. If you have a relationship with somebody where you don't have that, it's not really ever going to get close. Mm -hmm. You're really still keeping each other at arm's length. And this is the way, God doesn't want people that keep him at arm's length. Mm -hmm. You know, God didn't come and die on a, on a cross so that we can have kind of a, you know, superficial relationship with him. Mm -hmm. God wanted an intimate, strong, personal, powerful, Amen. glorious relationship with us. An openness that we can get nowhere else. That God can reveal himself. Hallelujah. And we can reveal ourselves to him in complete trust and complete, and, and complete hope. Hallelujah. So in the same way that that marital relationship needs to be so open and so close. Our relationship to God needs to get there. And, the, and so that, I think that's really the reason that God wants a bride that absolutely loves him. Mm -hmm. I mean, do you really want a weary woman that doesn't really love you very much? Mm. Right? You have a, a woman marry you for money? For power, prestige, or fame? Vice versa, you know? marry a woman for the same things you really want that in a relationship is never really going to be that strong because there's an ulterior motive god's the same way i mean god wants a relationship that is going to be completely built on absolute and total trust and absolute and total openness hallelujah so the revelation of one god is so vital to having that relationship with god and getting into the narrow gate mm -hmm. hallelujah all right when Jesus asked them to baptize in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, he was placing in the Word of God a dividing line between those who would love his name and cherish it, take it on, and those who would reject it. To reject the name of the Lord and Savior is to reject salvation and heaven. Mm -hmm. I want to tell you that if you reject the name of Jesus in mm -hmm. baptism, you are rejecting the name of God. You're rejecting the revelation of God. You're rejecting God. You cannot hope to have salvation. You cannot hope to have heaven. It cannot be given to you. Hallelujah. You know, Jesus talks about that. Jesus mentions that. Mm -hmm. Right? Mm -hmm. And how vital it is, hallelujah, that we have that close and wonderful and glorious relationship mm -hmm. with him. Amen. Praise God. All right. Um, Psalm 69, 34 to 36 confirms this. It says, Let heaven and earth praise him, the seas, and everything that moves in them. For God will save Zion and build up the cities of Judah, and people shall dwell there and possess it. The offspring of his servants shall inherit, and those who love his name mm -hmm. shall dwell in it. Those who love his name. Mm -mm -mm. And it astonishes me that so many people would never argue that when you lay hands on somebody to be healed, mm -hmm. to say, they want you to say, I, I, you be healed in the name of Jesus. Mm -hmm. Someone was filled with demonic possession. Be set free in the name of Jesus. Mm -hmm. Yet when 
the, one of the most important components of our salvation, where our sins are washed away in baptism, that somebody says, well, don't do it in the name of Jesus. Do it, Father, Son, Holy Ghost. Yeah, it's Jesus. No, no, no. We're to be baptized in the name of Jesus. We need to love that name. We need to take on that name. The bride takes on the name of her husband. Mm -hmm. The bride takes on the name of her husband. So those who love his name inherit the kingdom. Knowing the the knowing and loving, excuse me, the name of God is vital to understanding that God is one. The love of God will lead us to the revelation of that name in his word if we do not stumble on Matthew 28 and 19, but instead stand on that cornerstone scripture as revelation of the name. Mm -hmm. As revelation of the name. So when Jesus asked the disciple to baptize in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Ghost, he was asking them to reveal the name mm -hmm. and to reveal the oneness. Mm -hmm. Acts 2, 38. Peter said to them, Repent, excuse me, and be baptized every one of you in the name of Jesus Christ for the forgiveness of your sins and you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. Mm -hmm. And the name of Jesus is revealed here. Acts 10, 48. And he commanded them, talking about the house of Cornelius, when the Gentiles were baptized and filled with the Spirit, he commanded them to be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ. Then they asked him to remain for some days. Okay. So it's the revelation of the name. Mm -hmm. Matthew 28 and 19. Well, the apostles obeyed that because they baptized in the name of Jesus, which is the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Acts 19.5, the Ephesian church, on hearing this, they were baptized in the name of the Lord Jesus. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Hallelujah. So when Jesus asked his disciples to baptize in the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit, he was asking them to reveal the name and baptize in the name and reveal the oneness of God. Hallelujah. Mm -hmm. Amen. Praise God that Jesus is God manifest in flesh. Mm -hmm. Jesus is Emmanuel, which means God mm -hmm. with us. Amen. Unto us a son is given, a child is born. The government shall be upon his shoulders. His name shall be called Wonderful Counselor, the Mighty God, the Everlasting Father, the Prince of Peace. The Son is called the Everlasting Father. Mm -hmm. How is that? There's only one Everlasting Father. You can't call the Son the Everlasting Father. We're talking Isaiah 9, 6. You cannot call the Son that is given the Everlasting Father unless the Son and the Everlasting Father are one and the same. Mm-hmm. Because if you call the Son the Everlasting Father, the Everlasting Father stand up and say, hey, oh, hold on there, we got a trend here. Hold on there, you, whoa, 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 whoa. Isaiah, you got that wrong, man. You can't call the Son Everlasting, I'm the Everlasting Father. The Son's not the Father, I'm the Father. So you can't do that. No. Uh, so sorry, we'll have to strike that from the Word of God. But it's not struck from the Word of God because Jesus is the Everlasting Father in the flesh. As he said to Philip, if you've seen me, you've seen the Father. Yes. How do you say, show us the Father? Well, if you look at me, you've seen God. You've seen the mm -hmm. Father. Hallelujah. And we talked about last week how Jesus is the image of the invisible God. Mm -hmm. So Adam was crafted in the image of God, in the image of Jesus. Because even before God said, even before God created the heavens and the earth, before the first, before the first word of Genesis, Jesus is already the logos, the plan, mm -hmm. the blueprint that's going to happen. Hallelujah. So God already knows, because God knows the end of from the end from the beginning, what Jesus is, what he's going to look like in the flesh. Mm -hmm. And makes Adam in that image. Mm -hmm. And in that likeness. Mm -hmm. Amen. Hallelujah. Mm -hmm. That's powerful, you know. Yes, yes. Blows my mind. Of course. If you want to get answers to those theological questions, you have to sit down to some more Bible studies so I can explain to you why. Because there's a lot of people who think, well, you know, God created Adam and Eve and was sort of seeing how it would work out and wasn't quite sure. And then all of a sudden, up, oh, they ate that fruit. Now I'm going to have to come up with another plan. What am I going to do? The plan, the logos, was there before even Adam and Eve even did that. Amen. Theological questions that come out of that are rather dense, and I don't have time to get into them tonight. Okay. 
the revelation of the name through the revelation of the baptismal formula is the dividing line between the sheep and the goats, the few and the many. Mm -hmm. It is the dividing line. It is the thing that separates the few from the many. There are many that are called, but the few are chosen. Mm -hmm. Be a chosen. Mm -hmm. Be a chosen. Obey what thus saith the Lord. Hallelujah. Obey the word of God. Obey the voice of the shepherd and be baptized in Jesus' name and get the revelation that God is one and God's name is Jesus. Praise him. Praise him. The cornerstone will impact you one of two ways. I'm getting better with my PowerPoint, you know? If you throw a few things in there, you know, have a little bit of fun. Mm -hmm. You know, trying to... Excellent. Yeah, I could do better on this. Starting to get some of those custom mm -hmm. things, you know. Okay. The cornerstone will impact you one of two ways. Matthew 21, 44. And the one who falls on this stone will be broken to pieces. And when it falls on an animal, crush him. Mm -hmm. So the one who falls on the rock will be broken. But when the rock falls on you, you'll be crushed. Mm -hmm. right? now, obviously, the guy in the picture is just having some fun with this rock. But for real, mm -hmm. if that rock falls on you, you get crushed. Oh, yeah. But if you fall on Jesus, you'll be broken. Mm -hmm. right? In other words... You know, and I don't know if we, sometimes I get the picture of somebody with a bunch of broken bones laying on the rock, you know. And I don't really don't think that that's the way we ought to look at it. It's more like the breaking of a horse, you know. Mm -hmm. You break the horse. You break the will of the horse. A wild horse, you have to break it so you can tame it. The horse will do what it tells you. You have to break its will. And our will needs to be broken. We need to give everything to God and let his will be done by falling on the rock and repenting of our sins and giving ourselves over to the revelation. But if we resist that, it will grind us to powder. Mm -hmm. right? If we go against the word of God, if we try to get our own way, you know, oh, but, but my preacher told me to baptize in Father, Son, Holy Ghost, so, you know, that's the way I'm gonna do it because that's what he said, you know, and he's been my preacher for, uh, and my family have been this religion for years, so I'm not gonna walk away from this religion and I'm gonna do, because I'm not gonna listen to what you say. I know it's in the Bible, but but this is what this is what the, my, my, my reverend told me all those many years. You know, the, the rock, reverend had nothing to do with you when the rock falls on you, he's not gonna be there to lift it off you. Mm -hmm. It's gonna, going to crush you. So obey what thus saith the Lord and listen to what the Lord says because the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Ghost is Jesus. There's one God and mm -hmm. manifest in the flesh in Jesus Christ. Mm -hmm. Hallelujah. Amen. And it's the only way to be saved is to take mm -hmm. on that name. Yes. Praise Him. So don't let the rock fall on you. Amen. So Jesus even reveals himself in his fullness and oneness to John. Remember I talked about this, Paul, going back to Paul, that every, he said he got the gospel by the revelation of Jesus Christ. Well, here's the revelation, the revealing of God to John. You know, just God just completely opening himself up and revealing himself to John. I am the Alpha and Omega, says the Lord, who is and who was and who is to come, the Almighty. For those of you who question, this is red letter. This is red letter. How many alphas and omegas do we have? Two or three, four or five, you know? Mm -hmm. It's it, it, like that old TV show to tell the truth. Mm -hmm. I don't know if you're, you know, I'm dating myself when I talk about it, but it was an interesting show because they'd have three people standing up there and they'd have a celebrity panel and then they'd have the show's host. People up there would claim to be somebody, right? So somebody would say, my name is John Smith. My name is John Smith. My name is John Smith. And they would sit down and the panel would ask a series of questions of all of them and try to ferret out who the real John Smith was because two of them were lying, mm -hmm. right? So do we have three Alpha and Omegas? Do we have to have to tell the truth? I am the Alpha and Omega. I am the Alpha and Omega. I am the Alpha and Omega. Hmm, which one is the real Alpha and Omega? We'll find out tonight on To Tell the Truth. 
It's not that way, man. There's not three up there complaining, you know, or complaining, proclaiming to be Alpha and Omega. Jesus just said to John, I am Alpha and Omega. Mm -hmm says the Lord God, who is and who was and who is to come, the Almighty. Mm -hmm. So who is, who was, and who is to come, that's an eternal proclamation, mm -hmm. right? I am, I was, I'm, I am to come, I'm all of the, I'm omnipresent in time, I'm almighty, I'm, um, I'm omnipotent, right? Hallelujah, omniscient, omniscient. I know everything because I'm the beginning and the end. Mm -hmm. I know the beginning from the end. I mean, the Alpha and the Omega, it's God, baby. And Jesus is God manifest in flesh. And Jesus re just revealed himself to John as such, mm -hmm. as the one true and living God. Hallelujah. Mm. Amen. And, and correct me if I'm wrong, but I think when, when John sees that Jesus, his hair is white as snow, isn't mm -hmm. it? Yes. Beard? Light on the land. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Jesus and God are one and the same. Mm -hmm. Jesus is God in the flesh. Yes. Praise God. All right. Excuse <clears throat> me. The revelation of the name is the revelation of God's oneness. And I wanted to close with this scripture, Philippians chapter 2, 1 to 11. So if there's any encouragement in Christ, any comfort from love, any participation in the Spirit, any affection and sympathy, complete my joy by being of the same mind, having the same love, being in full accord and of one mind, do nothing from selfish ambition or conceit, but in humility count others more significant than yourselves. Let each of you look not only to his own interests, but also to the interests of others. Have this mind among yourselves, which is yours in Christ Jesus, who though he was in the form of God, did not count equality with God a thing to be grasped, but emptied himself by taking the form of a servant, being born in the likeness of man, and being found in human form, he humbled himself by becoming obedient to the point of death, even death on a cross. Therefore God has highly exalted him and bestowed on him the name that is above every name, so that at the name of Jesus every knee should bow in heaven and on earth and under the earth, and every tongue confess that Jesus Christ is Lord of the glory of God and Father. Now next mm -hmm. week I'm going to get into why we talk about distinctions between Father and Son in the New Testament, why we talk about, about God and Jesus in this way. Okay, and I think one of the things you have to remember that one, this little hint is that you're really talking about spirit and flesh. Mm -hmm. Okay, so when Jesus is in the flesh, right, this obedience to the spirit is a template for what we need to be with God later on. Okay, when, when we are filled with the spirit. Mm -hmm. But the one thing I really wanted to point out here is the same thing I pointed out last week, that the name of Jesus is the name that every knee will bow to in heaven and on earth and under the earth. Mm -hmm. No knees bow to anything but God. That's right. Mm -hmm. No knees bow to anything but the name of God. The name is highly exalted. It's the highest name that is named in heaven. So if somebody says, you know, hey, Yahweh's the highest name. No, no, no. Jesus is the highest name. Mm -hmm. It says so here in the scripture. Mm -hmm. Amen. Amen. Because the name of Jesus we talked about last week was Yahweh Shua, Yeshua, Yeshua. The Yahweh my Savior. Hallelujah. It's important for us to remember this, that this, that the notion, unless we get the revelation of the name in Matthew 28, 19, we are not going truly to have a relationship with Jesus Christ that we think we have. And let me just close with this. Because I remember, I'm going to stop sharing. You guys will probably see this some more, but I'm going to look at the people now. Um, okay. Change focus assist. I don't know what this is. All right. So um, the important thing is I, I never forget that when... Uh, okay, I never forget that when I was um, listening to a radio station years ago, right? I listened to this radio station years ago, and there was a very famous, I, I won't say the name of the comedy, it was a Christian radio station. And I'll never forget his name. Um, I'm not going to mention it. Mm -hmm. But he had this one young girl call. She sounded like she must have been in her late teens, early 20s. 
And she, it was a call-in show. And she said, you know, I gave myself to Jesus. I confessed him as my Lord. But I just feel like there's something I need to do. I feel like there's, there's just something missing. And I'm driving in my car. Mm -hmm. And I do have a tendency to talk back to the television and the radio now. Mm -hmm. and my wife tells me that it's futile. Mm -hmm. And um, I somehow believe at some point that somebody on the TV is going, oh, yeah, right, all right, you're right, you're right what you're saying out there. I got it. <laughs> and so I, I'm listening to this on the radio. She wants to be baptized in Jesus' name. She wants to be filled with the Spirit. She wants to be baptized. Oh, you know, this is what she's feeling she needs to do. And this guy, he, this is what he did. He said, well, you have to convince yourself, young lady, that you're saved. You have to keep talking to yourself. You have to keep remembering that Jesus did everything for you and you don't have to do anything and you just have to sit back and be saved. And it frustrated me so much because I wish I could have gotten mm -hmm. you know, to her and told her you need to be baptized because she's obviously feeling like she needed to do something. This guy was just really, you think about that. You know, you gotta convince yourself that you're saved. It's like convincing yourself you're in love, right? Either you're in love or you're not. I told this to my sons. I said, you know, how do I know I'm in love, Dad? Well, it's the same thing as when you're in a lake swimming. You know, you don't have, no one has to tell you you're wet. Mm -hmm. <laughs> you know, you're in the water. You know, right? You know you're wet. You'll know when you're in love, right? It won't be something you have to miss. And you'll know when you're saved. No one will have to, you don't have to convince yourself, and no one will have to convince you. You will know that you're saved. You will know that you're set free. You will know that you've been delivered. Amen. There'll be nobody have to sit there and tell you, hey, you got saved. By the way, you're saved. I'm, I'm going to tell me, man, I'm saved. I was lost, and now I'm found. Hallelujah. Yes. You know, I was a sinner, now I'm a saint. Amen. Praise God. I was, a, I was a nothing, and God made me everything. Praise Him. God is in me. God knows I've been baptized in His name. I've been filled with His Spirit. I know there's one true and living God. I give God praise. I magnify Him. I know God intimately. You don't have to tell me because I know myself. Because the Bible said they shall all know me from the yeah. least to the greatest. The ones that get saved. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. And that's why this Jesus name message needs to go out saints. Yes, it does. Praise God. So... Comments, queries, suggestions, and we've got about five minutes left. I'm going to unmute or turn on the thing so we can hear folks talk. There you go. Amen. A nice group here tonight. Can you see them? Can we see them up there? Um, you know what? Why don't I do this? Why don't I just quit the PowerPoint? And if I quit the PowerPoint, do you see him now? Mm -hmm. Yes, I see him. Everybody sees you. You only see me, but the whole gang out here sees y'all. Hello, everybody. 